Welcome to the Highway Church of Christ in Benton, Arkansas. Elijah thirsty, but he's now hungry. 
It says to this widow woman that God told him, I've ordained or commanded this woman to sustain you. He tells her, bring me something to drink, and now bring me something to eat also, a morsel of bread in your hand. Listen to her response. And she said, as the Lord thy God lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. God sends him to a Gentile area. This is not an area necessarily where the Jews were, the children of Israel, if you will, were, where they would have been friendly toward him and, and hoped to sustain him. But no, he's in this Gentile area, and God says, I'm going to send you there, but I'm still going to sustain you by the hand of this lady. He finds this woman, he says, go get me some bread and some water to drink. And she says, listen, I just don't have it. I've got a handful of meal. I've got a little oil in this cruise, this container, this jar. And I'm just getting two sticks to make a fire, make a cake or a piece of bread, some bread and some water for me and my son. And we're going to eat it. And since we have nothing more, we're going to die. You see, she was looking at her circumstances and making an assessment based on what she saw. Elijah was here prepared to demonstrate to her what it meant to trust God. Because God told Elijah, I'm going to sustain you by this woman. And so if God says, I'm going to protect you and care for you and sustain you and provide for you by this lady, by her hand and her provision, then surely she would have enough to provide for him. We continue reading. Elijah said to her, fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. In other words, go and make the little cake that you have. Go and prepare it. He says, but make thereof a little cake, or make me rather thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and thy son. I, I could wish that there were time to stay right there in verse number 13. Because he says, I want you to go and take this little bread that you have, this little oil that you have, and then these two sticks and make this fire, and you go make that little bit of bread that you have, but you bring it to me first. You see, she had to trust that God was going to continue to bless her. I could wonder if that were you or I, what would we do? You know how uh, a little bit of bread lasts. If you go in there and look at the sack, the loaf of bread, you've just got those two little ends left that kind of look like hands, you know? We call it the hand bread in our house because, you know, nobody wants to eat the hand bread on the end. But if you go to your house and you look at that sack and all that's left is the hand bread and someone says to you, you go and make me enough for me to eat and then you feed yourself and your family next. You might think, well, sir or ma'am, I don't know how long hand bread lasts in your house. It just can't stretch that far. But my friends, a little with God can surely do a lot. I know you've read your New Testaments where the Lord took a lunch of a little boy and was able to provide for a multitude, feeding thousands of people. And so here now Elijah tells this woman, you, you take your little oil and you take your little meal and you go and make a cake, but you bring it to me first. Demonstrating that to feed God's prophet was primary. Trust God. Hey, I think so many people don't want to trust God in that way. Do people trust God when it comes to sustaining them? Do people trust God when it comes to holding back finance from the Lord? Well, I want to help the Lord's church, but I got a car note, house note, kids need shoes, mama needs a purse, daddy needs a new car, whatever we have to do. Do we trust God and say, I'm going to give to God first? Everything else, God will sustain. God will keep us moving. We're going to trust the Lord. How many people do you think take that position? Or on the other side, well, I'll do mine first. And I'll pinch off whatever's left. You see, Elijah told this lady, you prepare the Lord's cake first. In other words, you, you, you prepare for me first. And then you go and do it for you and for your son. Do that next or last. You see, he wanted her to not look at her circumstances, but to trust God. When you and I look around at the circumstances, they may be bleak. When we look at the world around us and see so many people surrounded in sin, where's the world going? Where's our country going, our city going, our neighborhoods? What about our schools? Friends, do we trust God? Do we trust the Lord? Just today we announced that two young people put on Christ in baptism. 
I say our schools, our country, and our world is in good hands. We have two more Christians in the world. You see, it just kind of depends on how we choose to look at things. He wanted her to look through eyes of faith. As we talked about this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of oil, or meal rather, shall not waste, it shall not run out. Neither shall the crews of oil fail until the day the Lord sent rain upon the earth. There was a drought. He says, your oil and your meal are going to continue to be bountiful until this, this drought ends. Now, can you imagine that? If you have a little bit of cooking oil and you pour it out and you look, there's still a little bit more in there. You pour it out, there's still a little bit more in there because God is continuing to sustain. So Elijah learned to trust God. And now because he learned to trust God, being, being able to drink from the river and eat from the ravens, now he's able to teach trust and faith to someone else. What'd she do? Verse 15, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. Now the Bible doesn't tell us that they had a feast and a fatted calf and, and everything that they wanted, does it? No, but did they eat? Did God sustain them? You see, faith doesn't always give us everything that we need. God doesn't promise to provide everything that we want. But he does promise to provide for our needs. You might just have a Vienna sausage and crackers. We don't have to have steak and potatoes, but God will provide for us. He will sustain us. As Jesus taught that parable, or I'm sorry, not the parable, the Sermon on the Mount, as was taught uh, a few weeks ago by Brother Greg, that, that Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, he says, look, God knows what you have need of. He feeds the birds and he feeds the animals. He knows how to feed and sustain you. So we just have to trust him. And so she went and did. And my friends, for you and I, we have to trust. I believe this might be one of Luke's favorite passages in Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses uh, I believe that's three through five, then that we should trust in the Lord with all of our heart, and lean rather not on our own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. We ought to trust the Lord completely. So continuing here, the, 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 the meal did not run out, and the cruise of oil did not run out. Because God had spoken that word by Elijah. So in this first wave of adversity, she demonstrated faith. She was able to trust God in the oil and the meal to sustain her. <coughs> My friends, that's not always the end of the story. Sometimes we get little victories to give us strength and courage enough to face the bigger ones, the bigger challenges. The things continue to grow, not to tempt us toward evil, but to help us to grow. You'll remember what James said in James chapter 1, count it joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But listen to what he says, but let patience have her perfect work that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We can't ask out of every hard situation of adversity. Sometimes we need to stay in there so that we can grow in our faith. God is trying to help us to develop. Adversity helps us to grow. You ever started working out? That first day, oh man, you're sore, and you're thinking, I should never have done that. But then later on, we start to see the results. You work hard, and you think, I'll never be able to get this and understand this. And after a while, you learn, and you know more than you thought you could. Faith works the same way. We exercise our faith, and we grow. So after this first wave of adversity, she's able to exercise some faith, but now my friends come to the second and more devastating situation for her. Verse 17, and it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Here she is learning to trust God. The meal and the oil were sustained. And now she loses her son. You know the old saying, when it rains, it pours. But here's this lady trying to 
trust the Lord, trying to do that which is right, trying to help to provide for the prophet. Now her son is gone. Sometimes uh, it is the case that these things can happen to help us, though. I could wish that each person were able to have this sort of perspective as is lined out for us in Psalm 119, <coughs> 75, which reads, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. That is to say, God, I know that whatever you're doing is right. And whatever is befalling me, it's, you are still righteous. God is not in heaven looking to say, uh, be evil toward us. I'm going to get you. I'm going to stick it to you. No, whatever comes, we know that all things work together for good. And that we can trust the God who loves us, who created us in his image and has a heaven prepared for each of us. I wish that we could all be like that psalmist and say, God, whatever comes, you're righteous. You are righteous and faithful no matter what. Her son falls gravely ill, and she, as a result, doesn't understand. And listen to what she says when she comes to Elijah, verse 18. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee? O thou man of God, art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? She's saying, in other words, have I done something wrong that you're trying to bring it back to me? Am I now paying for my sins and I've lost my son? I, I guess like like I might be tempted to do, like maybe you might be tempted to do, when things happen, we question maybe God's motives. Maybe we question, have I done something wrong? Maybe something happened to you and you start to ask, what did I do wrong that this thing should happen to me? And we try to look for that one thing wrong to fix it so that life will get back even again. But you know, that's not how life works. That's just not how it works. Sometimes things just happen. This lady lost her son, and she now is asking, is it because I've done something wrong? You're, you're trying to call to remembrance that I'm an imperfect person? And Elijah, verse 19, and he said to her, give me your son. And he took him out of her bosom, and he carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. So he, he grabs his son, he carries him up to the loft, I guess on the roof where he had been staying. And he cried unto the Lord, and he said, oh, Lord, my God. How hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? Elijah now is also having to trust God. He now not understanding and saying, what, what's going on here, God? Are you now visiting evil on this lady? He had not necessarily demonstrating the greatest measure of faith, but this is here so that you and I can see and learn. Verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times, and he cried to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. He's laying prostrate over this child. He's praying to God, please bring this child back to life. So he had compassion on his lady. He, it seems, is trusting that God can do something else. He might have just walked out. But he's praying. My friends, uh, let it never be the case that in adversity we use prayer as a break in case of emergency sort of reaction. Sometimes maybe you have said, as I have said in times past, well, the least I can do is be praying for you. Have you ever said that or heard that said? Well, I can't do anything for you, but the least I can do is pray for you. No, my friends, the greatest thing that you could ever do on behalf of another person is talk to Jehovah God on their behalf. Ask that God would bless them, sustain them, help them. Don't you remember what Paul told us in, in Philippians chapter 4? Be anxious for nothing. Don't let yourself be overwhelmed with care about anything in life, but in all things by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. The peace of God that passes all this will keep your hearts and minds. Don't you remember what Peter told us? Cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. So prayer is the greatest tool that you and I have when it comes to facing hardship, adversity, temptation, sin, or anything else. And so Elijah, he knew that he could do nothing with this lifeless child, and so he sought God. He learned to trust God for his sustenance. She was learning to trust God for her sustenance. 
now she had to trust God with the life of her son. And Elijah lays down over this boy and he prays to him that he will praise to God rather that the, the child's soul would return to him again. And I love the way the chapter uh, verse 22 begins. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Have you ever questioned whether or not God is listening when you pray? You ever prayed and wondered, God, are, are you sure you're listening to me here? You know how someone is, is this thing on? We might ask God because maybe it's taking a little bit longer than we might desire. Or maybe he's busy over there helping you all the way over at your home. I hope he's listening to me in my home. Elijah prayed and God heard him. Every time you bow your head in prayer, if you're on the interstate, you just want to pray to God. If you're all by yourself, if you're with your family, if you're on the moon, you can pray to God and you can have assurance that God will hear your prayers. This woman was hurting. Elijah seemed to be touched with compassion because of her hurt. And he prayed to God. And the Bible tells us very plainly that he, the Lord heard his prayer. And he answered the soul of the child came into him again. And he revived. And Elijah took the child and then brought him down to the chamber to the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see thy son liveth. Her faith had now been rewarded in trusting Elijah to pray. Elijah's faith had been rewarded in that he prayed to God and the son's life was revived. And as a result of trusting in God, look at verse 24. The woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God. The word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. She was able to know that what he was speaking was going to be true, that he was in fact sent from God. The indication here is that she was going to receive that which he had to say because she knew that he was a man of God. See, my friends, when we put our faith and trust in God, that says something to the world around us. That demonstrates something to the people that are around us. If you are on your job or in your family or around the people with whom you have contact and you do not demonstrate faith, you do not trust God. At every wind of adversity, you're falling on the floor crying that the, 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 the sky is falling. My friends, how can any person come to trust God as a result of your behavior? Don't you remember what Jesus talked about our influence? Let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But if we are cowering in fear and everything that happens, God cannot be glorified. We are demonstrating true trust and faith in God. We must have enduring faith. <clears throat> You remember there in the book of Job, he received a message. Before he could finish hearing that message, he's probably reeling in disbelief. He gets another message. And before he can truly uh, accept and understand what's happening, he gets another message and another. And it just hits him in waves and waves and waves. But Job never sinned against God or charged God foolishly, the Bible said. Why? Because he was a man that trusted in God question then for us is, will we trust God? Will you trust God? No matter your circumstances, whether you're like Elijah having to trust him in the first place or this lady with the, the small uh, amounts of resources with her meal and the, the oil that she has or whether it comes to trusting God in times of sickness and death. Now, I don't mean to say that every time a person is sick that God is going to raise them from their bed of affliction. That's not what we're trusting, but we will trust that no matter what, that God will still be there for us. Whether raising them up or comforting our hearts, God will never leave us. He'll never leave us. He is faithful. You remember, there, there's a, a, a clause in Matthew chapter 28 that I think is often overlooked. We talked about it at least in part this morning. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, 
We'll start there at verse 18. This is something we're all very familiar with, but, but I want to get us down to the, the, the last clause here. Jesus says to his apostles in Matthew 28, as he's about to depart and go back to be with his father, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And here it is, folks, listen to this. And lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the end of the world. See, Jesus was not going to be there with them physically. Jesus was never going to leave them. He was always going to be there for them. He even told them later, though he would not be in their presence physically anymore, if we look at John chapters 14 through 16, he says, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the Comforter, which was to say the Holy Spirit, to be with you. The Lord will never leave you. He will never forsake you. For those of us that may be seasoned Christians and having gone through uh, many phases of life, we, we have to turn back and demonstrate and teach our younger Christians to have faith and to never waver, to never go back into the world looking for comfort and strength. We have two new sisters in Christ. We have to, to demonstrate before them so they can know whenever something happens, I can trust God. I will have enduring faith and trust in him. Come with me. Because, my friend, in the end, those that endure adversity, those that stand up under the pressure of hardship, James addresses them. He says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. When he is tried, he says, when he is tested, when he is made sure and strong, when he proves and demonstrates that he or she will not waver, he says, for that person will be a crown of righteousness. That's the same thing, or the crown of life, he calls it here. Paul called it rather the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But my friends, that is for those that endure, whose faith does not waver. That's a promise that we can count on, rely on, and trust in completely. These people, which we read tonight in 1 Kings chapter 17, they learned to trust God. They learned that no matter how terrible things may seem, that it's not the extent of our circumstances that demonstrates the faith we have. It's our trust in God no matter the circumstance. So if you've not already entrusted your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to do that. So that you can have some assurance. There's not very many things in this life that you can be sure of, if any. There's some things that you can count on, and you can say statistically these things may happen. There's really nothing you can be certain of in this life. You know, it's often said, really in jest, the only thing you can be sure of is debt and taxes, but some people don't even pay their taxes. And we really can't be certain of that. We don't know the time that we will die or if we will die. The Lord will return. So even of that, we can't be certain. But there is one thing of which you can be certain. If you obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, if you hear that he is, in fact, the Lord of the Lord, King of kings, the Savior of your soul, if you believe that with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength to the, to the extent that you're willing to confess him before men, to turn away from a life of sin and walk in the light of his word. If you are willing to go down to the waters of baptism where you would meet the blood of Jesus Christ, have all of your sins washed away, the Lord will add you to his church. Here's the assurance that you can have. When Jesus returns, he will take you to heaven. You can read that all in the scriptures. John chapter 14, a wonderful reminder of promise of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a wonderful reminder of promise of that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a wonderful reminder of that the Lord is going to return for those that love and obey Him. And for those that do that, He will take you to live with Him forever. And that is something that we can be 100% certain of. So if you've not obeyed the gospel, why don't you do that tonight? In just a moment, we're all going to stand up and sing. That song is designated to encourage you. 
to make you think about where your soul is. If maybe you're a little uncomfortable about where your soul is, that's a good thing. Be sure about where you are. If you have more questions, come and ask and we'll stay with you and we will answer your questions as many as you have because we want your soul to be saved. If maybe you are one been enduring hardship, but maybe you've allowed your faith to waver. Maybe you haven't been faithful in your attendance. Maybe your behavior has slipped. Maybe you've not demonstrated what it means to be a true child of God and servant of Christ. Then you can repent. Get back in line with the Lord according to 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Repent of your sins. Confess your fault. Don't you know that God will forgive you of all your sins? Whatever your need tonight, if you need to obey the gospel, repent of your sins to get back renewed in fellowship with the Lord. Won't you do that right now? So together we stand and sing our song.